Welcome to another episode of Cosmic Echo, a Taylor podcast. This podcast applies a scientific viewpoint on the strange and bizarre phenomenon that happens in our lives when we sleep in altered states. In this episode, we speak with Ryan Hur. He runs dreamstudies.org. We have spoken before with Ryan, but this time we go more into his research behind lucid dreaming and dreams in general. Ryan also talks with us about his newest book, Lucid Immersion Guidebook, a holistic blueprint for lucid dreaming. If you'd like to learn more about Ryan's work, you can visit our website at taileaters.com backslash CE podcast. Also, you can support the podcast by going to the same website and clicking on our Patreon page. Well, without further ado, let's get to the interview. How are you doing today, Ryan? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Hey, no problem. It's glad to hear from you again. Um, getting into it, we spoke with you before in the past, um, but can you give us a little background of yourself and your dream work? Sure, yeah. So, I, you know, these days I've been calling myself a dream educator. I've, I've really been focusing on helping people work with their nightmares, their sleep paralysis nightmares, and most recently getting them into learning lucid dreaming um, and taking them deeper into lucid dreaming. And, um, you know, I'm by trade, I'm a writer. Um, my methodology tends to be phenomenology um, when I actually write peer-reviewed stuff. And, um, I'm, you know, I don't know, when I look at my big picture of what I'm trying to do um, with my work is kind of bring back the intuitive art into this post-rational world, kind of waking up um, these parts of ourself that uh, we've kind of swept under the rug um, in our scientific materialistic culture. All right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your education uh, background a little bit? I, I noticed you have a master's. Is that right? Yeah, that's yeah. I've got a master's degree in consciousness studies oh, okay. uh, at John F. Kennedy University, and um, it's a very fun program. It was it's a mishmash of philosophy, psychology, and religion studies. And um, I have uh, a background in anthropology and archaeology. Oh, okay. So for myself, I really focused kind of on psychological anthropology when I went through the program, and you know, even applying that towards. Um, psychological archaeology as well. I've got, you know, this uh, tiny little interest in, I say tiny because there's about five other people in the world who also are interested in this, uh-huh. of seeing how altered states of consciousness show up on the material record mm-hmm. and looking back at, at prehistoric peoples and, um, and kind of, you know, a lot of it um, is more of an art than a science at this point but trying to say, well, we've all we share the same brain. These people took naps. How does this how does this all work out in terms of, you know, their sleeping and their states of consciousness and, and how that affected their culture and how can you see that on the material record? So that's that's also kind of part of my um, background as well. Oh, okay, great. Um talking about your your new book here. Um, so can you tell us a little bit of a uh, intro about this book and um, the differences between this book and other lucid dreaming books that you've written before or other lucid dreaming books that you have read and worked with in the past? Sure, yeah. You know, the, so I've got, uh, a, it's a digital kit that I've produced and I call it the Lucid Immersion Blueprint. And it's a collection of ebooks and and uh, audio recordings in which I interviewed some other lucid dreaming contemporaries of mine. Um, and it's, I consider it an advanced guide to lucid dreaming. Um, what I was noticing um, is that there's plenty of guides to getting into lucid dreaming, how to do it, how to get started, um, but there's almost nothing on the market about kind of the deeper waters mm. and um, getting past the, those first exhilarating moments. And then what happens when sometimes lucid dreaming doesn't behave exactly as you might wish? And, and how to sort of um, um, come to terms with that and work with the dream and the dreaming imagination to, um, to, to really benefit from, from this wisdom that sometimes comes, uh, it seems like not at our best interest, but it actually is. And that's just part of the psychology of the dreaming mind. So that's, you know, that was my motivation for writing 
this book and, and making this project available is um, picking people up um, when they've fallen down from some frustrations from lucid dreaming, either by not being able to achieve what they want to achieve or not having as many lucid dreams as they wish, or, or for the minority of people out there who start getting the lucid dreaming and they have really disturbing experiences and nightmarish experiences, mm. um, bringing that to light about how this can actually be um, an opportunity for healing. Okay. I know, and what do you mean by healing in that sense um, through lucid dreaming? Well, you know, I, there's something... The door with the most pressure behind it opens first. Hmm. And this is something that happens with dreaming in general. And it happens in lucid dreams as well. And often people get into lucid dreams who are interested in, in controlling their dreams and doing kind of whatever they want in their own virtual reality, hmm. which is a, a very fun perspective. But it's, what happens is, is when you actually get into the dream space, uh, this doesn't really pan out all of the time. And you realize that you're still there, and there's a lot of kind of things happening under the cover of darkness mm. once you're in this, you know, imaginal realm. Um, and so when I say an opportunity for healing, I mean that there are often conflicts that occur in lucid dreams that are just opportunities to face something, face some fears, um, face hesitations, and, you know, and for some people this is facing the past or, you know, um, Maybe you're facing something that's unpleasant about um, their present predicament. Hmm. Um, and rather than running away from it or trying to crush it or transform it into a bunny, um, you know, really take a look and dialogue with what's going on. And something amazing happens in these instances, which is that there's an energetic flow that occurs between, you know, we can say the unconscious mind and the conscious mind is kind of arbitrary, hmm. but that which you know and that which you don't know. <laughs> Uh, and things open up, things loosen up, and it's just it's like all this energy pours into you and courage and creativity. And in my own life, it's really affected my waking life, and, and I think it's really changed my personality and kind of forged my identity and, and kind of my interest and allowed me to, um, to do what I do. Oh, great. Um, in your book, um, you talk about building the foundation of lucid dreaming. What exactly... Uh, do you mean by that, by chance? I, you know, I think there's basically three prerequisites for going into lucid dreaming safely and securely. Um, and most people only talk about two, and I talk about three. And but the two ones that everyone talks about is you need to have basically um, got to keep your sleep hygiene mm. under control. Um, you know, lucid dreaming, consciousness in dreams, um, tends to occur in REM sleep. And you've got to usually have really long sections of REM in order to get to these states. It tends to happen in the morning when our cortisol levels are higher and we're sort of in this almost huge state between dreaming and waking. At least that's how Alan Hobson and, and his colleagues talk about it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're not getting enough sleep and you live in, you know, the, the Western culture, which is completely sleep deprived, it can be actually be difficult to give yourself time to even, you know, get there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, I discuss sleep hygiene and the importance of just being able to get into it, give yourself the mental and physical space to have a lucid dream. And for some people, this is different for everybody, actually, because some people are light sleepers and they just basically need to allow themselves to have the time. To mm-hmm. For others who are deep sleepers who don't remember a lot of dreams, they might have to do something more extreme, like change their sleep patterns involving more awakenings, things like that, to kind of stir up the vigilance levels that allow dream recall to take place. And this is it, and that's the second piece of this. The second to represent is the dream recall. Hmm. And um, once you have the foundation of sleep, then you start looking at you've got to have good dream recall to become consciously aware in your dreams, because otherwise there's nothing to work with. Right. Um, and, you know, the good news is, is that dream recall comes back really quickly. Uh, Dreaming and remembering dreams is a skill. It's a cognitive skill. And uh, all it takes is really some attention during the waking life to basically build bridges between our dreaming self and our waking self. And it's interesting. It happens like uh, it happens in a number of days for some people. Some people it takes a little longer. But once you start recording your dreams 
and doing some of these other tactics that I discussed in the book about kind of inviting dreams back into your life. Um, the recall increases, and the dreams themselves transform. They become clearer and longer and sort of more understandable. There's actually a shift in the dream content that's remembered itself as you pay attention to your dream. And then the third one, which for me is a prerequisite, and, and others say, eh, whatever. But for me, it, it, as I teach through the dream, I think it's completely a, a necessary ethical step, which is that is this a good timing to get into lucid dreaming for mm-hmm. you at this point in your life? And the reason I say this is that lucid dreaming is, is an, an altered state of consciousness, um, and things can do come up that are unexpected, and you want to be mentally prepared for this, and you want mm-hmm. to be in a, a secure place in your life. I, um, I don't recommend that people who are just starting, for instance, a psychotherapy program or um, if we just had a death in the family or a major life change, that they try to pursue lucid dreaming um, actively. Mm. Because actually, in some of these you know, times in our life, you know, these crossroads, lucid dreams will come on their own accord. Mm. And, dream, and, and it's best at those times to just let the dreams come to you rather than really kind of go for the goal. Um, and so that's the question I ask is this, you know, do you have support in your life? Um, you have the time to even like process the things that happen, and um, and you know this is I consider lucid dreaming a psycho spiritual activity, mm. and you know all of yourself is on board, and uh, you're really just kind of selling yourself short if you're not preparing for some of these unexpected challenges um, and discoveries that happen with lucid dreaming, the spontaneous elements of lucid dreaming that that can be quite intense and and also exciting. But um, I think many people um, just don't know that this is coming, and they're blindsided by it. And, I mean, this happened to me, and I know lots of people this has happened to where they've, um, they, they started lucid dreaming spontaneously or got into it, and they just got a little freaked out, a little mm-hmm. too fast, and they lost all interest completely in looking at lucid dreaming and looking at dreams in general. And that, I think, is a shame, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's just about, uh, that's my perspective, and, you know, I say, hey, just ground yourself be, and, and be ready to, to have the support system lined up. And that's my three prerequisites. <laughs> good sleep habits, good dream recall, and is this the right time? Uh, that totally makes sense to me. <clears throat> um, the title of your book um, has holistic in it. I was just wondering exactly um, kind of what you meant by that, unless you already touched on it. Well, you know, I just said, um, when I just said that all of our self is on board, that touches on it a little bit. And I, I really mean that, you know, um, our, our emotional self, um, you know, our logical and mental self, and also our, you know, our psycho-spiritual self, or, you know, um, the, the, higher, the higher nature of our self, however you uh, see it. Um, you know, your goals and aspirations, but also your belief systems towards the divine, towards uh, the nature of reality, towards your place and purpose in the universe. Because all of these belief systems play a role in the creation of dreams uh, and inversely in your greatest fears. And when you have an understanding of where you're at, these things aren't so aren't so weird and so scary, mm. um, because a dream can can really shift your perspective of what reality is, and it challenges your per- perspective of reality. Mm. And it's nice it's nice to kind of these challenges are, are awesome because we learn from them, and we can let go of belief systems. We can we can expand our belief systems, or we can reinforce them. It's 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 really up to us and and our own process and kind of where we are in life. So when I say holistic, I really mean, you know, mind, body, and soul. Okay. Um, you know, all of our intelligence, our, our, our multiple intelligences. Okay. Um, you talked about challenging, how lucid dreams challenge you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how lucid dreaming has challenged you, yourself, or changed your life? Sure. Well, you know... I'm, I'm unusual, and I realized this, <laughs> that I started lucid dreaming when I, was, when I was young and went through several periods in my life where I had lots of nightmares. And in the lucid dreams, 
at every point in my life have helped me with overcoming these nightmares. And uh, I honestly would be a different person if I hadn't had these opportunities to, to sort of face the, to these challenges head on. Um, from, you know, the fears of, you know, that come when you're changing from 14, 15 years old and, and really moving into your adult body to all the fears of young adulthood with who am I and where am I going. Hmm. And then even now, you know, I take on new roles and responsibilities like as a as a father. I, you hmm. know, my wife just um, gave birth, you know, four months ago. Congrats, and, man. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, and again, you know, here's, you know, life's always changing and I'm taking on new roles and, and my lucid dreams are uh, reflecting this as I think my last dream I saved my infant baby as he was clinging to a side of a cliff. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's well, you know, sometimes these dreams aren't so um so hard to decode. <laughs> uh, and but I've really gotten um I would say a lot of courage and um the uh, the ability to to know myself mm. and understand my particular sense of creativity and um, my particular interest through these dreams because they, they come to us as gifts, um, but sometimes the gifts have teeth. How, in what way do you think that um, lucid dreams can help other people as well? Um, obviously, it helped your life from what you just told us about it. Well, you know, lucid dreaming comes naturally to many people, and that's what's really nice about as dreaming is entering into the culture again. Uh, lucid dreaming is almost a household word. I don't like there yet, but with movies like Avatar and especially Inception, mm-hmm. Inception I think really pushed the envelope um, and, and, and put the concept in front of so many millions of millions of people um, that it's possible to be consciously aware in your dreams and, and have a modicum of self-control and even sometimes you know the ability to manipulate the dream environment and, you know, go through different layers. I mean, very powerful movie, and it got a lot of things right, I, th- I think, mm-hmm. um, which, I, which I also really appreciated about <laughs> the um, producers of the movie because they yeah. did their homework, you know. They, uh, they interviewed Stephen LaBerge, you know, the foremost you know, researcher in the topic, and, and others as well. Wow. Um, and so, um, you know, as it turns out, women are more likely to have lucid dreams than men. Um, it, it seems to be about a, a 60-40 split. Hmm. And the reason is is that women remember the dreams more simply for cultural reasons. Okay. Possibly there might be some biological memory um, associations as well that have to do with the emotional brain, but, but the research is a little cloudy on that, and, and uh, we're, we're not really sure. It's a nature-nurture kind of thing. You know? But obviously women um, in our culture are, are more allowed to discuss their dreams and what they mean, because dreams are very emotional. Um, dreams are more about our emotional logic and, and sort of the emotional mythologies of our life than really anything else. And and so for for most men in our culture, this is just you know you stay away from it. Um, so it's amazing that we remember any dreams at all as as men. Um, and but. But men are more interested in lucid dreaming and learning the lucid dream than women because they have this sort of yang, the temperament of, I want to um, to take this initiative, I want to accomplish uh, a task, you mm-hmm. know. Um, some people call that the desire for control, but I think that that's um, actually more of a media myth than anything else. It's really about um, kind of a hunting-like temperament. I want to achieve this particular task. Um, and here's how I want to go about it. And, you know, that's definitely the yang, masculine, you know, traditional masculine temperament. And so that's why so many men are interested in learning lucid dreaming. Uh, and at first, you know, I think most people are interested in it for uh, doing things. The two most popular things are, are the experience of flying, um, the static experience of you know, flying around and, and going where you wish as if you were a bird. And the second one is having sex. <laughs> and it must be the safest sex in the world. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the ability to engage safely with um, with your fantasies um, and to, you know, have, have pleasure and ecstasy um, without 
implicating another individual or, you know, really going, sort of stretching your own boundaries of, of, um, of your sexuality. Um, two very big hot button issues in learning from lucid dreams. But that's just scratching the surface. I mean, these primary motivations, I found in my experience, give way after, after lucid dreamers kind of get into the experience and other things start coming up as well. And these I would call these sort of underlying creative energies that first manifest through sexual energy or the desire to fly, hmm. but then they kind of transmute and there's other things going on as well. And I think that these might be some of the same um, powers that come unleashed when you basically do any kind of meditative or spiritual art hmm. in which you're honing your intelligence and your attention span towards essentially being a more mature individual um, and taking responsibility for yourself, understanding your own personal sense of power, being in relationship with other powers around you and knowing how to, to be in that dance. You know, it's not all about you, it's about us. You know, being in community and, and, and harnessing these energies and all kinds of, um, you know, depending on just your own temperament, your your spiritual background, um, where you are in life, how old you are, kind of, you know, all these things, they always, you know, come cemented down to individual differences. Mm. Um, but in my mind, the lucid dream is an opportunity to essentially to be here now. Yeah. Um, and to face and, and, and um, interact with what's, so what's happening. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, isn't it like one third of our life is spent asleep, and that's a good portion of our life not understanding um, what's going on, or being aware of it. So, um, I could see that being very important. Yeah, well, you know, Carl Jung was, um, used to talk about the process of individuation, um, about becoming, you know, maturation as an individual, and in particular, the maturation of the human soul. Um, towards transcendence, and and you know this is a union theory is is you know something that only some psychologists are into, mm. but but his perspective I think really speaks beyond you know this particular mm. institution, which is that he says you know this process of maturation is happening regardless of whether you focus on it or not. It's mm. just that focusing on it kind of uh, may allow it to happen more quickly. And it can be more pleasurable, and it can happen in a more controlled manner. You're basically, you're ritualizing your maturation rather than having it happen at spontaneous moments that the world chooses for you, hmm. which could be a stage, or which could be, you know, I mean, the, you know, the whole human drama machine. Right. Um, and, so, and so we are maturing and going through our life and learning and always integrating our, whatever just happened to us with our personal mythologies, it's happening anyway. Um, what lucid dreaming offers an opportunity for is to become more of a, more of a, of an actor in this, and, um, and, and really to surf, surf, the, surf it more enjoyably. Hmm. You're talking about Carl Jung, and I'm very interested in this, um, shadow idea that he has, and you talk a little bit about it in your, um, in your book. I'm not sure if you called it the shadow, or, um, the dweller, the threshold. Um, I know it's been called that. Um, what do you um, suggest, and what do you um, perceive this thing being that people often encounter? Um, can you describe, you know, maybe a little bit about what it is as well, like what it looks like or resembles, or you know, just a broad um, sure. idea of what it is. Well, I mean, in, in Carl Jung's perspective, is the shadow is is an is an archetype that comes through archetypal imagery. Um, you know, ar the archetypes themselves in, in his re um, reckoning were never seen. They're just the energies that are behind all forms in our mind. And the shadow is one of his primary archetypes, which manifests as aspects of ourselves that we have disowned. Hmm. That's the primary thing, is that it's, um, I think um, the poet Robert Bly says it says it best it's, it's the parts of yourself that you toss into a bag and you know never look back into that bag and yet we're we 
go through our lives carrying this bag behind us mm. of all these parts of ourselves that can be things that we don't like about ourselves, things that we're ashamed of. Um, they can be early childhood um, memories that, you know, that just that haunt us because we don't want to, to deal with it or integrate them. But also, um, Carl Jung talked about the gold in the shadow, which is a concept, it's an alchemical concept, hmm. that we also toss our bright spots or our genius or our creativity into the bag if it's not socially acceptable. Hmm. So, you know, the... Uh, the architect's son who wants to be an artist but is, um, is forced into you know, you know, a, a life that he doesn't find creative. Mm. Um, he puts his artist, artistry in, into the bag. But you know, by bringing it out of the bag, he could make his architectural world even more creative by you know, integrating his artistic self with, with you know, his with his current career. This is just like an example of, mm. of what we do. And we all do this. That's, that's the theory, is, is that we all do this. And, and so not only are these, these shadow elements um, about ourselves, but we also, as we go through life, we project these shadow elements that we don't want to look at onto other people. Mm. Okay. And that's, uh, that's sort of this sociological theory of where um, racism comes from. Oh. And other kinds of um, hatred uh, on the group level towards towards any kind kind of group of people um, or animals or aspects of nature. You know, it's just you know we literally project our own sort of self hatred on, onto others, and then we punish them. Hmm. We say, look at that terrible person who's so this and so that. Um, and you know, you really can see this in everyday life. Um, I certainly see it in my own life. When yeah. I, I notice I'm like in my head, I'm really grumpy about somebody and their behavior, and then I realize, oh, that's a trait that I have, and I, that's a trait about myself that I don't really yeah. like very much. And they're just doing it, and, and so I'm very, you know, energized by it. But it's a negative, a negative energy. Well, that's shadow. That's shadow energy. And so the process is called, you know, called reclaiming the shadow. You know. And accepting the shadow, okay. and um, by bringing the shadow into the light, and you know, this sort of integration occurs with with the wake of ego. So, how does this look in dreams? In in, in dreams, this energy often takes the form of um, of entity, malevolent, hateful, spiteful, ugly creatures mm, okay. that are scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and this is. Um, and you see across culturally, because um, we all tend to have a sort, of, sort of the same idea about what is about what is scary, um, um, something that we can't see very well, something that might seem um, well. In the Western culture, we have a, a great fear of the primitive, okay. and so there's lots of um, there's there's a fear that it's like an ape-like creature or yeah. something like that. Um, it can be just somebody, um, you know, um, that you like a historical figure. It can really come very clearly through. Or it can be someone like who used to bully you as a child who shows up in your dream and is bullying you now. And you're like, hey, I'm in my, you know, my 30s now. Why am I being bullied by a 10-year-old successfully? Um, and it's because that shadow energy is still present. Oh, okay. Um, and so it shows up in dreams, and it, and it, and it certainly shows up in lucid dreams. Uh, and that, you know, because really... If you stay in a lucid dream for longer than a minute, the, you know, the dream continues creating, you know, energetic situations, hmm. um, regardless of how um, self-aware we think we are. I mean, it's just, too, you know, the, your mind is still it's going forth, it's doing what it does. And so they're spontaneous elements, and they happen all the time in lucid dreams that last, you know, longer than the first, you know, moment of, well, this is exciting, I can do whatever I want, mm -hmm. or I can manifest this object, or I can go through this portal, you know, you, you can do these um, really wonderful acts of creation in the lucid dream, but what happens next, what happens in response to your action is often unconscious, uh, and it comes from the dream, and it's, it's spontaneous, and you don't know what it is, and it can happen in opposition to your desire, um, almost like playing a game. Mm -hmm. The dreaming mind is very um, um, tricky, like that. Uh, so it's a lot of it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs>
If you enjoyed this episode of Cosmic Echo and would like to learn more about Ryan Hurd and his work, please visit our website at tailleaders.com backslash CE podcast. And also there you can support our podcast by clicking on our Patreon page. We look forward to bringing you additional episodes in the near future, but until then, happy dreaming.